So, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, not a problem, buddy. Good stuff. Um, so can you just kick us off by telling us a bit about your background and what you do today? Yeah, um, so I'm a four-time, all-time world record holder in powerlifting. Um, have a master's degree in biomechanics. Studied under one of the top schools in the country with Dr. Kramer and Dr. Volick, and when a lot of the NSCA founders were at Ball State University in Indiana, um, which happened to be my hometown as well. Um, I probably got famous training people from working with Ranger Regiment in the United States with their Special Forces group. Um, trained them from 2006 to 2009 um, and fixed a lot of injuries and a lot of issues that they were having with their strength training. Then that led to um, fourth infantry contracts in Colorado. Then that led to 82nd Airborne contracts. Then that led to uh, Border Patrol contracts. And then that got me pretty famous at training the local fire departments, which now I'm in charge of four, which is roughly um, about 260 to 300 firemen a week. Wow. I bet there's some injuries going on there. Yeah, it's interesting because when I, I was hired to reduce the injuries in 2011, and since that time, we have saved collectively on all of the fire departments about $6 million in injuries. Wow. Yeah. So wow. the thing of it is, is and I'm not saying that what I do is insanely smart. I would say it's it's innovative com comparatively to what's been applied to the fire service and tactical mm -hmm. community. Um, but a lot of it's just getting them a little stronger, a little more mobile, and a little bit more athletic for the job. Because it, before that, they might have had weight rooms or, you know, some some personal trainers here and there. But in reality, what happens is that um, a lot of guys get in the fire department, they get comfortable. Um, they don't have to get tested every year to be physically capable. And then 20 years goes by and they're a fraction mm -hmm. of what they were when they got hired. And that yeah. becomes a humongous issue. So most of the problems that I fixed have been lower back, knee and shoulders. Um, and a lot of that's just balancing out the muscle tissue and teaching proper technique, which is ironically, you know, good gym technique transfers to good lifting mechanics when you're dealing with people, equipment, mm -hmm. ladders, things like that, because they learn to have proprioception or body awareness and multiple avenues, which is the way I train anyway, which is, you know, we might be doing resistance training, but they're seeing different exercises every week mm -hmm. so that the transfer stays high and variable because what they do for a job is variable. Mm -hmm. And and that, and that can be carried over to so many different professions and so many people's daily life that they need to they need to bring in. So I mean, is that a, is that a strong element of your training, incorporating variability into actually how you're approaching your your gym programs? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's ba the baseline of conjugate. The problem is is that beginners tend to have too much variety because they don't know what they're doing, and the ultra advanced guys tend to know what works for them and what needs to be introduced at different times. So the reason the conjugate training is not very popular these days is because we have kind of stepped back into the dark edges in training. There's a lot of good research coming out on how to train smarter, but the problem is, is people's patience levels are too short. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's us as society is a problem. You know, we have all these issues with people wanting to sell us 30 day diet plans and, 60 day cut plans and all mm. this stuff when in reality it's a lifestyle change 100 percent. and i think i think because i want to come back to this 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 sort of idea of conjugate training because i heard you speaking uh the other day about uh the different premises of, of, and developments of strength you know through the soviets the bulgarians and then and then the amalgamation and, and sort of a conjugate training style so i was wondering if you can talk us through what conjugate training is versus like your old fashioned strength style conjugate training is the ability to utilize multiple faucets of training, such as strength, hypertrophy and endurance and, and in a general terms and utilizing them to optimize many areas at one time. So when you're training conjugate, you're not specifying necessarily on one particular area like strength or muscle size, you're kind of playing with all of those particular variables in an educated fashion so 
you know, you have optimal amount of reps and optimal amount of intensities and optimal amount of time under tension, a lot of which those exercises are rotated and changed depending on structural or postural weak points. So when you're designing a conjugate training, if you're uneducated, it's going to look a lot like CrossFit in certain ways because there's rotation with very minimal thought processes to why you're rotating. But a highly educated conjugate coach is going to have reasoning to why they utilize certain exercises at certain times with certain people with certain timelines because, you know, let's say like I have five or six exercises that I use as not only training but testing in the bench press that are not necessarily straight weight in a straight bar. But because I have kind of utilized those exercises around the same time I've hit PRs, I know what I should be able to do on those exercises to make sure that I hit the natural bench press PR. So it's basically allotting yourself educated variety so that you don't overtrain one particular area or train one area too much and make the other areas suffer. Yeah. And that it, therein lies the, the balance of experience because many people will get success, myself included. You get success in one area and you want to keep chasing that success rather yeah. than like you've just alluded to the patients is like, okay, I've made a gain here. I've made a PB on my squat. Let's go down and have a look at where the weaknesses is and weaknesses are in the chain. Where, where can I maybe improve my mobility? And once I've improved that mobility, improve the strength within that new range that I found. But that's, that's a very technical and patience orientated way of approaching strength that as we have in this social media age, it's like the quickest way to add 20 kilos to your squat or the quickest way to add 10 pounds to your bench. Like we want it quick. We want it now. So how do you work with your athletes to get over that mindset? Because presumably people must come in with that mindset with you to training and you've got to try and break that mindset down. Most of the time when people come to me at the gym personally, they already know what they're getting involved with because most of the times people that want quick fixes are not going to come to my gym anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cause I don't, I don't really market to that crowd. And a lot of the clients that I've had, I would say 60 to 70% of the clients I've had in the past, you know, two years I've had for at least eight or 10 years. Wow. So point being is I have a high retention rate, mm -hmm. but I don't just take anyone. So I think that's difficult because for a lot of trainers, especially ones that are starving and needing work, you kind of got to get in where you fit in for a while until you can decide who you want to work with and have a clientele base and stability that allows you to hand select the people that you want. Because a lot of it's not, it is a patience thing, but it's a personality thing as well. Some people think that they want to be champions or they want to be good. But the first thing I tell them is 10 years, 10,000 hours. And I look at the look on their face. And if they have the wrong look on their face, I know they're not going to be there for more than 60 days. And it's almost 90% foolproof. Mm. And the reason is because, again, we go back to the impatience thing. Um, I'll give you a prime example. When I was a kid, um, I had just turned 20 years old. Like I was almost still 19. And I had squatted my first 700-pound squat. Wow. Um, so I had done 665 to 670 as my last meet as a teenager and then go to my first meet as a junior and hit 700. That's crazy. And I remember one of the greatest lifters in the world come up to me, Ed Cohen, because it, the meet was only an hour or two from his house. And he said, look, if you can hold on for another six to eight years, you're going to break way over 800 pounds. Now, for me, that was amazing because he believed in me to get stronger but to most people, that would be a swift kick in the balls because they're going to say, what do you mean? I got to train another decade to put on another hundred pounds. And he was almost right because within it took me another three and a half years to break 800. Mm. But I asked him later why he told me six to eight. And he said, I wanted to see if you were worth my time to help. <laughs> Tricked you. <laughs> yeah. So he was basically telling me, um, this is a, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm. And mm. just because you're good at 19 and 20 years old, doesn't mean you're going to be a world record holder if you don't have any patience. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's a lesson that I wish I had learned at that age. I was incredibly impatient as well. I wanted it all and I wanted it now. And 
if things didn't happen for me immediately, then it was very easy to get the head down and go, oh, you know, it's over for me. Like, and and, and that comparison to others starts kicking in. So what what would you see as the most, the biggest mistakes that people who are either just starting their strength journey um, are, are making at the moment? I would say for the most part, you want to stay off social media. I think the biggest advantage that a lot of us had, my mind would be the last generation that grew up in the late nineties and early two thousands is that the webs, the web was around, the internet was around, but you didn't go on there to really find out how to train and you didn't really go on there to compare yourself to other people yet. Um, but now the problem is, is that although powerlifting is a lot more popular and you also have a lot more federations and meets in reality, the smarts of training has diminished rapidly. So the best thing you can do is surround yourself with people that have been where you want to be. And that doesn't mean following them on Instagram. That means doing like what I did. You know, I lived in Indiana and I would drive up to Chicago to train with Ed Cohen, which was three hours north, or I would drive three hours east to Columbus and train with Louis Simmons. I didn't email them and ask them a question. I didn't watch their YouTube videos because they didn't have any. I didn't really do anything like that other than read articles in Powerlifting USA. So I would say the first step you want to do, if I had to do it over again, which I felt like I did it pretty right the first time, is read advanced articles, start to understand physics, start to understand power, start to understand strength, and understand the different medians of strength, i.e. maximum strength, speed strength, endurance, all these other factors, and then start playing around with figuring out where your weaknesses are, both structurally, posturally, and mentally, and start to slowly implement those into your training. See, the problem is that in recent years in education, what we have what we have actually come into contact with is teachers that tell students at every level, focus on what you're good at and stay away from the bad things, like the things you're not good at. So if somebody sees somebody excelling in math, but they're not good in science, well, in theory, the conjugate system teaches you to focus the weak points. Mm -hmm. So usually your weakest link is usually your, also your biggest limit limiting factor. So I think you almost have to be reverse wired to utilize a conjugate thought process and become very good at it comparatively to what people are today. Because you know, if they have a strength in the squat, then they overutilize it until all the weaknesses become injuries. Mm. And usually a weakness causes an injury. And so because it causes a faulty motor pattern. So at the end of the day, um, you know, that's what you as a beginner, you really want to go and seek the people that you want to be like and you want to train with them in person, not ask them questions on a social media site or just look at what they're doing, because in a lot of times. When you're looking at somebody's training protocol, say even if you got on my Instagram and looked at what I'm doing, that may not be the right thing for you at this time. There might be other things that you need to be doing because I've been competing for 30 years. So certain things that I do now, I need to do now, but I didn't need to do 20 years ago. Um, and so those factors become difficult to select what you need to be doing, which is why if you're truly interested in being a great strength athlete or a coach that you need to be coached and mentored by other people that are way better than you at this moment. Yeah, I would totally agree with being around people that can diffuse and infuse you with that knowledge, because it's one thing reading about it. And it's another thing, putting it into actual practice. I remember that the great, the great times and the great jumps in my skill level in training and understanding of the sport have been when I've been working with coaches one-on-one -on -one, great coaches and I always link back to to a guy called Mike Causa in England and he's an Olympic weightlifting coach and he really got me to think in that exact way like your biggest weakness is actually your biggest opportunity once you can mm -hmm. find that that opportunity it's easy money it's easy mm -hmm. growth like everything else that you've already maxed out and keep maxing out that's that's yeah. the hard gains so what, you, what you're trying to say, which is exactly how you're saying it, but I'll reword it a little, is your weaknesses are the quickest way for you to get better because wow. they take the least amount of work to get better versus exactly. your strengths might be at a ceiling limit already 
And so 1% on your strength might be difficult, but 5% on your weakness would be easy. Exactly. You know, the, the problem with that is, is that you have to have that mindset already drilled into your head to want to work your weaknesses. Mm. And I think that's what becomes very difficult in this day and age and why we may see um, larger numbers happening now in individual lifts and lifters, but we see much shorter careers and we see people that are only good at one lift, maybe not three. And it's because they gravitate towards what they're good at. I mean, right now there's more deadlifters over 900 pounds than there ever has been. But then you go look at their other lifts and you're not, they're not that impressive. Mm. You know, so so, hyper-focused. They're hyper-focused in one area, which is going to cause a ton of damage. Um, You know, there's, there's all kinds of lifters that you can point fingers at that are like that. But I know a handful of guys that can deadlift over 900, but then they can't squat 650. It's a crazy imbalance. Yeah. Humongous imbalances. And then it's ironic that those guys are the ones that get hurt all the time. Mm. So again, it's all about, you know, working your weaknesses and being patient. And the other reason patience is key is because for most of the people going to listen to this, including myself, we don't have those freakish Bo Jackson or, you know, um, Deion Sanders genetics where marginal or shitty training is going to elicit immense results. Mm. I think the biggest problem that, and you know, it's, it's our fault as not necessarily me per se, but like in this generation, the people that are trying to show other people how to get stronger and better are banking on the fact that most people are going to quit within the first year. Mm. So they're trying to keep them entertained versus train them smart. Um, you know, the real advantage to the Bulgarians and the East Germans and the Russians 50 years ago was the fact that they looked at everything in 10 year blocks and that's how they progressed athletes. And that's how in 1984, um, if you look at the prime year of strength in the Eastern Bloc countries, just in Russia alone, they had almost 100 master of sports in the super heavyweight division that were capable of breaking world records. So imagine that you have 100 Michael Jordans. Might I mean, be getting something right. Yeah. So that's where you start looking at going, okay, well, this is, this is getting interesting that not only were they the strongest countries, but in numbers, they had the strongest numbers. Mm-hmm. So if one of their best guys got hurt, they had one dude ready to take their place. that wasn't far behind. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what's interesting about their system is that it worked for thousands of people versus one. And that's why I always gravitated towards it and studied it so so rigorously and why I'm writing a book now on the particular topic is the fact that people have to understand that you can be excellent at something within reason if you train insanely smart and your timeline's long enough. Mm. But if you think that, you know, you bench 185 or 100 kilos and you think you're going to bench 400 kilos in a year, it's not going to happen. But that's the problem is everybody else sees these, these immense strength athletes doing these immense numbers but they don't realize the amount of work that went into that before any of that was touched and that's that's the one reason i really like olympic lifting because it's a developmental sport and we are not a developmental nation anymore so china Mm -hmm. bulgaria you know china iran a lot of these other countries and i'm not going political on it but they see the long-term progression in their olympic sports and they develop it over many many blocks of Mm -hmm. training and that's why Americans suck at it is because we never have a long-term thought process to nearly anything. Mm. Yeah, I would agree with that. It, it's, it's, I'm curious, what are the main, how would you define the main principles of the sort of Soviet style of training versus either American training or, or, or other, other, other areas? Well, the first thing is, is that, you know, the Soviets and the Bulgarians would select athletes already based on genetic proudness as a child. So if you were already, say, five foot 11 at 10 years old, you're not going to go into Olympic lifting no matter how hard you want to go because they already realize that your mechanics are not built for world class weights. So over here, strength training is more of a hobby. Over there, it was a lifestyle. And so their selection process was much different. That's one thing. The next thing is, is that they never looked at anything less than six months to one year blocks. So when they would train they would have long-term development processes and macro cycles. So we have multitude of different cycle links, but you have training session, 
you have a micro cycle, which would be about a week. You have a meso cycle, which would be a conglomeration of weeks, usually three to five. Then you would have a macro cycle, which could consist of anywhere from 12 weeks to six months. Then you would have like annual plans. And then the Russians would even go as far as quadrilineal plans, which were four year blocks. Now, that didn't mean that they did every, they knew every day of what was going on, but they had a systematic approach to making sure that the right trajectory was happening at the same time. Now, when's the last time you opened up a book that was from the UK or America and they showed you a four year mentality to development of strength and you, you don't see it? And that's really the limiting factor on what we do, because, if, like I said, again, if you're benching 100 kilograms, you better have a five year plan to get super strong because it's not going to happen in a year. Yeah. Yeah. And where would one, if someone listening now has kind of thought, Oh, that's really interesting. Where can I find the information of how to structure those cycles and actually get a five year plan into place? Where would you find that? Well, that's, what's really getting scary is because a lot of the books that I have, um, they're not really in print anymore. So a lot of the best training manuals in the world, I'll give you an example when I was starting to dig for more research than what I had for my book, um, I was very lucky in having friends that had been around weight training for many, many years and had vast libraries. One of them would be Dave Tate. He's only about 40 minutes from my house. And I went and sifted through his entire library to find books. Um, the one book that I really needed and looked for was by Zatsiorski. And it was a biomechanics book. Hasn't been in print since about 2012. And they wanted four hundred and fifty dollars for the book. Yeah, that that's one of the things is I've seen the prices on some of these old books is crazy. Well, it's because that's when the prime knowledge was out. I was on Mark Bell's podcast three months ago, and mm. he was asking me why do I think that training is made twenty years backwards? And I'll tell you why. When I was in college, you could get all of those Soviet texts for about twenty dollars a piece from a place called Livonia Press in Michigan. Once they closed down or became obsolete, a lot of those printing companies stopped doing any of that. And so the ones that had those particular books wouldn't get rid of them anymore mm -hmm. because of the amount of information that are in them. Um, so that's very sad because 20 years ago, you could have got a hold of a lot of it. And now only the top minds have it and they don't want to get rid of it. Yeah. Understandable. I mean, it's almost like coveted knowledge now. There's so much because information is different to knowledge. You know, there's so much information out there online, but there's very little real knowledge, knowledge. Absolutely. So, like, is anyone, is anyone either printing out and scanning these books in and putting an online version out there? or? Well, not really. And I don't know why that is. I think it's because there's not a market for it. I mean, you and I are interested in training smart, right? Mm. But the average, the average person is not. And that case in point, these companies went out of business not printing any of this knowledge out because nobody was buying it. Mm. And that's, what's really sad about the whole situation is, you know, it's just, you know, it's kind of like YouTube. I mean, I'll give you an example. I got 350 videos on my YouTube channel, right? Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. That if people really wanted to train super smart, they could watch that entire YouTube channel and probably be about 75, 80% on their way. The videos that I have posted that are the highest level of education have the least amount of views. Yeah, it's crazy. So again, you know, it's just these small pockets of people that want to know how to train smart. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is like, well, how do I do this in three weeks? And if it doesn't happen in three weeks, I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 a, it's a sad state of affair. I don't know how one gets around that. I think that's just like those who really want to seek out the knowledge and go through the pain and the patience that it takes to make the mistakes and then yeah. make the mistake, get the injury and then step back from it and say, I'm going to have another go at this, but I'm going to do it slightly different. And if I do it slightly different, I've got to find different information and go from there. But so many will do it, get injured and that's it. I'm done. Or they'll do it. And then they'll say, right, I'm not, I'm not going to train my knees because I have bad knees now. And then that's yeah. it. It's over. Well, when Lou, you know, Louis Simmons was the prime example of that. You know, he, uh, he breaks his back and somewhere in the 70s, fixes it, becomes a better lifter, injures himself again, becomes a better lifter because he's learning from his mistakes. But in reality, if you look at everything as a whole, how many people have you ever seen 
to get those types of injuries and come back and actually one get better or two even stay with the sport. Very so rare. the problem is is that you know it's like everybody tell you when everything's starting to get really tough and you're getting ready to quit is when everything's getting ready to change. Mm. Yeah, well, that's the, the 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 night is darkest just before the dawn. It can exactly. only it can only get better. It can only yeah, get and that's the biggest dawn. problem is I think lifestyles get in the way. You know, I mean, I've give I've given up my whole life to be super strong and know what I know and I don't know everything but the thing of it is is like there are only a handful of people I've ever ran into that were like that case in point we were at the Swiss conference you know that was a couple of months ago it was here in town it was in Easton which is about 30 minutes from my house and uh that's probably one of the best strength conditioning conferences in the world and you go there and it's amazing you know I'm 43 now and I'm running into people that are speaking as well, and they don't even lift anymore. Mm. You know, and we're similar age. And I'm just thinking, like, how do you keep progressing and learning if you're not constantly trying to push yourself? I'm not saying that you have the capabilities to break world records for their, your whole life. But it's it's amazing when you go to these conferences. And I'm not saying everybody, because there were quite a few people there that this doesn't fit. But if you go to your average national conference and really walk around as a strength conference or a personal training conference, how many people have you been to some of those? I've been to some in the UK at the NEC, okay. a few in Birmingham and everything. And so how many of those people, when you go to those conferences, I want to know this from your perspective, mm. how many of them, when you go to those conferences, do you look around and go, these guys even work out? Quite a few, quite a few. I mean, there's quite a few around and quite a lot of it revolves around pure aesthetics in the bodybuilding sense. There's a lot in that term rather than because that's the sexy thing. The bodybuilding is the sexy thing now. Yeah. So that's what gets all the attention. It's like how big your biceps can get or how big your your quads can get. And that doesn't transfer over into what real strength is. No, I'm just saying like when we come, when we go to the NSCA conferences or you, you're looking around and people are interested in working out, but you can see that they don't really live the life. Yeah. So life no, are, that's not always the case, but I would say at least 50% of the coaching conferences that I've been to, the coaches don't even practice what they preach. So how can they be learning? Mm. You know, yeah. that's why you look at A.S. Mevdiev, Verkashansky. I'm naming a lot of guys, Vorbiev. Mm. These are probably the three major guys that made strength training what it was in the Soviet Union. They were all medalists. So not only did they have their PhD, they were also Olympic medalists. So think Incredible about talent. that for a second. Over here, we have all of these coaches that are really, really good, but they don't have any hands-on experience. So A.S. Mevdiev and Vorbiev, both in certain Olympics, would take out the flag and carry it for the team because they were the team coach. So they had not only been in the shoes of the athlete, they also went back to school and studied it and made it their life. Mm. So imagine the amount of willpower and determination that it takes to do something like that versus over here, you have half of your baseball coaches, half of your football coaches. None of them have actually even played, mm. you know, so yeah. then they don't have a conception of what it physically takes to do the job. And I'm not saying that's always the case. And I'm not also saying that you have to be the best in the world, but you should practice what you're doing because how it reacts to you in some ways can be how it reacts to others. And I think that, my knowledge base has come so far from not only training other people, but pushing my own limits. Yeah. Okay. Trying to push outside the comfort zone. Cause once you're in the comfort zone, then that's where, you know, you stop growing and we hear that so often, but it's, it's one of those things that's not bred within us. Again, we don't have to get political on this, but it's this whole um, victim mentality mindset that is so mm -hmm. pervasive. Now it's like, the world has to bend to me because I have all my problems and why can't, you know, people accept that I have problems and I'm, you know, the, the world doesn't owe you anything. You've got to find a way to engage with the world and improve. And that's down to you. That's down to you as an individual, but that's not what people are being told at the moment in the media. We're always being told that it's someone else's fault that yeah, you're not you're doing well. You're absolutely right. And it's not any different over here. I think it's a, it's a sense of in the next 50 to 75 years that the countries are going to slowly just push more control on the individual because in, in theory, you know, like you go to your average grocery store, or your average Walmart, people are so uneducated and so undriven 
mm. that I'm I'm concerned with not only the UK but the United States as well. Well, I think there's so many aspects. Like I've had people on the podcast, like Dr. Tracy Gapin as well. He's talking about testosterone levels just through the floor. Like many men I walk past now and like, I'm like, that's, you know, there's no arms on the bloke. There's no legs on the bloke. He clearly hasn't done any lifting in the day of his life. Like he's spent all the time behind the computer and like, it doesn't, it's not conducive to a strong society with a balance of masculine and femininity. It's like, we're, we're almost being like feminized by the, by the, the whole fucking system like we've been testosterone is being taken away we're t- having plastic in our in so many different areas of our lives that's estrogenic and like and if you don't try and counter that in some way through eating good quality food and training and working on your mindset and your mentality then yeah you're going to be on a slippery slope down to fucking weakness absolutely i mean you, you get your nail on the head with the plastics and parabens and sulfates and aluminums um, they're chemically just killing us and, mm. you know, killing our, the, the first way you control a population is being able to control. Obviously, if you have a bunch of people that are not masculine anymore, they're not going to be nearly as hard to take over. Um, that's one big thing. And two, um, you know, aggressiveness, unless it's in the army or in certain sporting events is looked at as a negative thing. Mm. When in reality, if the world was falling apart right now, which is coming close to happening, they're going to they're going to really regret not having the guys that are highly motivated and highly driven and highly hormonal because those are the dudes that are going to step up, grab the weapons and go to work, you know, and it's sad because I was actually just watching commercials on the Russian army and what they're utilizing as propaganda to come into the army versus what the Americans are using to come into the army I and it's like no really <laughs> oh it's you don't you don't even no, tell know. me tell me what what is it <laughs> well so the american commercial that i saw was a girl that was raised by two women so obviously she came from a lesbian family and they're talking about the benefits of the army and how much it's going to help them through school i'm like uh you sign up for the army to fucking grab a gun and kill people <laughs> and in the russian propaganda video it shows a dude waking up at 4 a.m. doing push-ups, jacked to the gills, cleaning a rifle, and cracking shit from like 150 yards in a uh, you know in a firing range and like doing all this crazy special forces shit. And I'm just thinking like we are in deep <laughs> <We're> shit. But <laughs> fu- well, this is the thing, and the, the irony is like if you start advertising to young men like that and to to people in a developmental age who are ready to join the army, I think they're going to respond to that. I think someone telling them like, hey, there's more out there than just being told that you're like, you know, you should be passive to everyone and you shouldn't be strong and you shouldn't stand up and you shouldn't be masculine. Like there's a lot of, I think a lot of men are crying out for that now. I mean, you only have to see people like Jordan Peterson, who's just been meteoric and loads of people who are encouraging young men and and women to stand up and fucking do something with their lives. And Mm -hmm. His, his great phrase, which always resonates is something like you, you don't always, you don't have to be aggressive to everyone. You don't have to be violent to everyone, but you have to be capable of it. If you're not capable of it, then there's no, there's no virtue in not using it because you can't use it. You're not controlling it. You're just, you're just a passive useless thing that can be just yep. like pushed aside. But if you have the capacity to use it and be masculine and be dominant and be violent, but you don't use it, then that's where virtue comes in. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, that's where you, you still need to be, you know, heavily, like you're saying, you need to be heavily capable to attack an event that would be there, you know, at, at, at a moment's notice. And we're just not, we're just not those kind of people anymore. We're too soft. And mm-hmm. it's sad because we're still weaning in America off of our golden, our golden generation, which was pre or post world war II you know, our, our country was going the best way it possibly could have, I would say economically and overall as a male female role was in the fifties. Um, and that probably was very similar in the UK. Mm. Um, and although there's been heavy advancements in all sorts of life in the last 70 years, some things have went really backwards really fast. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. I think, you know, that we're, we're sort of this, there's a lot of sort of perpetuated guilt in the media, you know, that we should feel guilty about how our societies have developed. And I think that's, that again is feeding into this whole thing of men not wanting to, or not feeling able to stand up for what they believe in. And, you know, and that's a right to 
you know, a strong life, a strong existence, good health, you know, good meat, like whatever it may be, oh, yeah. good food. And, um, you know, we'll see that and we'll see the corresponding. I think we are seeing the corresponding backlash. And that's why social media companies are getting so um, censorship orientated because it challenges right. the narrative so much because that, that's the only way they can push back on some of this stuff. So I, I, I do. I am kind of hopeful that people are pushing back because, you know, I, I started this podcast in a way because I think there were voices out there that weren't being heard. And, you know, the context weren't being heard. And there was too much of a pervasive narrative on things like anti-meat and, you know, masculinity being wrong. And I just think, you know, I had to do a little bit to try and push back on that and, and increase the amount of voices out there. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, if we weren't supposed to eat meat, we wouldn't have incisors. You know what I mean? It's the whole thing. Oh, it's, it's insane. Yeah, it's <laughs> totally crazy. Um, but I want to just roll back around a little bit onto, onto training because the way that I came about I heard you is on uh, the Chris Bell show and you were talking about traction versus compression. And for me, this was like a big wake up moment because I went through that, that sort of arc of development through my own training, you know, a lot of bodybuilding growing up, up until about the age of 18 and then injuries pushed me back down. Like I had a bad back. And then I went to train with this guy, Mike Causa, and he showed me a lot about how the spine functions differently depending on different loads. And we started talking about the physics aspect and we started talking about, you know, glutes and priming your, your body before you train and lots of that stuff. So my back pain went away and then I had a knee injury. Knee injury took me nearly five years to rehabilitate, just looking, going through different stuff, you know, thinking I knew all the answers and those answers weren't giving me the right outcome, but I stuck with it eventually got through, rehabilitated that. And I've had about the last year and a half, I've been able to train nearly back to back 12 week cycles on squat to increase squat and different deadlifts. But in sure. the last, in the last month or so, I've started to get issues with a little bit of back pain. And mm -hmm. it was because it just clicked. One of the things that I haven't been including enough in, in my training is traction. I've been including a lot of compression exercises and it just so happens that that's catching up to me now. That's my, my kind of overall thought. And once I started including traction, nearly like that back pain just disappeared. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so I wonder if you can explain to us the difference between traction, compression, and why it's important to consider that in training. Yeah. If you look at, if you look at normal weightlifting, usually it's a function of gravity, right? So everything's pushing straight down. So if you're bench pressing, it's pushing straight down on your chest. If you're squatting, it's pushing straight down on your spine. If you're deadling, deadlifting, it's pushing straight down on your spine because gravity's happening in a vertical plane. Um, so with that being said, most of the lifting that most people do is going to be in a vertical compressive factor. And so with that being said, not only is training should be rotated in exercises and types of contractions also types of pressures so when you use a traction versus compression understanding which has kept me in the game for so long kept my back from ever really being hurt um, is the fact that I will do only one to maybe two compressive movements in an entire workout and then everything else is traction based so traction would mean either that it's pulling the spine apart so we could look at like a pull up. Your body's wanting to pull down from gravity, but you're pulling up. Or a lap pull down would be traction because it's trying to pull up and you're trying to pull down. So when that happens, you're getting this to go up on your back, right? Um, if you look at a reverse hyper, that's actually pulling your back apart. And because of the body angle, the weight is pulling down on the fulcrum, but it's not putting any vertebral spinal compression in a vertical sense on your back so it's allowing those back muscles to get strong hypertrophied while the discs and the vertebrae are getting traction in those movements same thing with the belt squat the weight's going to be around your hips and it's pulling down on your hips so there's no compressive factors really there below the hip socket and then you have or above the hip socket then you have things like good morning machines that would be pushing you forward but they're not necessarily pushing you down um all of these different factors are huge. I love to do like winning planks and band crunches because I feel that most people hurt their back standing. They don't hurt them on the ground. So doing abdominal exercises on your feet 
are another way to do traction based movements, but also have immense transfer over to squatting and deadlifting because you're in similar positions. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're rotating the different types of forces, both vertically and horizontally that you're putting on your body. And so having a conjugate mindset has a lot to do with those particular physics. And because that's the thing. So if I, if I'm picturing a spine in my mind and someone's coming into a, a, a kind of a deep back squat, and then they have that, uh, kind of, I guess you call it butt wink at the end. That's the same almost movement that you have in that, um, reverse hyper style, you know, it's extension, but because there's no compression coming down, you get no issues with discs. That that's very similar. But if you watch a really highly trained person doing reverse hypers, their butt doesn't wink like a normal person does. They're going to wink in the hip. They're mm -hmm. not going to wink in the back in the low back. And so what I have found is most people that have a butt wink issue, it's because they're quad dominant and they don't know how to preload their hamstrings and their glutes. So if you watch me squat, you're never going to see me butt wink because I'm using all of my muscle groups to squat, which is why I've had world records. Mm -hmm. Most people that butt wink is because they're shifting pressure all the way over to their knee and they're taking it off of their hip because their hips are weak. Again, weaknesses dictates form. Mm -hmm. um, A.S. Medvedev said that in the 70s. And he talked a lot about how we always look for structure and technique to be the leading factor of our abilities to get better. But in reality, technique is designed not only through consistent motor patterns, but abrupt strengths and weaknesses. Now, when you start listening to that, it starts telling you that everybody's technique can improve no matter how they're built based on which muscles are weak and which muscles are strong and which muscles are balanced, both in the antagonist antagonist muscle groups that allow our body to function perfectly. Most of the time, a squat issue is going to be a lack of quadricep to hamstring ratio, poor back posture, and poor abdominal function. If those areas are balanced, then in theory, no matter what type of squat you want to do, you're going to be in the best mechanical position, barring that you don't have a joint issue. And how are you assessing the 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 strength of that. I mean, in my mind, the assessment comes in the form of doing the exercise and seeing what breaks down first. I mean, how are you assessing through your athletes where you're pitching those weak points? Well, it's interesting. You know, you have testing exercises, so compound movements. So if you put somebody in a multi joint movement and it goes up to say ninety percent or above, coaching cues are out the window because now instinctively the body's going to try to survive. So I find that maximum effort is the easiest way to see the weakness because once you go into fight or flight or maximum effort, true maximum effort, your body's going to try to get the work done as efficiently as it thinks it can. Right mm -hmm. now to an advanced coach, you can might be able to see it doing dynamic work or maximum velocity rate of force. Because if I make you go down with say 40% of your best on squat, but you have to stand up as fast as you possibly can, you're going to make the same mistakes that you make when you go heavy because it's so fast. You can't think about it. It's instinctive. The other thing you can do is put somebody in a battery of, ex of accessory movements and figure out which ones they suck at, right? Like most people, unless they're very weak or very small, don't do very well on a glute ham raise the first time they see it. So if they can't do even two or three glute ham raises, you know that the anterior to posterior chain is in balance right off the rip. Um, and a lot of times you can see it through posture analysis and muscle imbalances, right? Like you start looking at somebody and if they don't have any glutes, they're going to be a butt wink style squatter, guaranteed. fucking teed. Mm. The other thing too, is they have a lot of frontal quadricep development and you can't see their hamstrings. They're probably going to have issues there as well. Um, just by how people stand and how they react under various loading, if you're educated can tell you a lot. And that's why we do a lot of online coaching. And every one of my online coaches have a master's degree and some of them even played pro sports. Um, it's because they've seen so many of these issues and fixing these particular muscle groups all but alleviates the problems. And so sometimes we are built to be better at something faster, but the people can still be very good at something if they're patient enough to be good at it. For sure. That's patient. I mean, that's one of the things it just it just triggered in my mind that it used to frustrate me a lot is that people giving technique cues when the 
the client or the person clearly didn't have the strength to to carry out that cue you know keep no. your back straight in the squat keep your back straight in the deadlift don't round your yeah the, you don't have the strength to retain that position so then therefore the exercise needs to be regressed or changed or find something else to to put in there but it's it was it's that's why there's such a i believe such a gap in the industry because this stuff is complicated like we're talking about biomechanics we're talking about once you've got the idea yeah then but it, well, it's, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this i i made the perfect statement to a, an army general probably oh it's been 10 years ago now um and the statement i said to him is we were talking about getting the guys prepped to train themselves so what i was doing is i was coming in at fort carson colorado and training the highest level officers so that they could train the guys under them. And then everything would filter down. And I was talking to the main guy and he's like, well, I don't understand why these guys need 80, a hundred hours of classroom work to understand the human body. And I said, we were actually looking out the window in his office. And I said, you see that Abrams tank over there? And he goes, yeah. I go, how long does it take to go to school for that, to learn how to drive that tank? And he goes, <laughs> Well, that's a pretty complex machine. That takes about a year to 12 months to even learn how to drive it. And I said, and you think the human body is less complex than an Abrams tank? <laughs> so then I went on his whiteboard and I showed him endocrinology, biomechanics, muscle fiber typing, VO2, energy systems, Krebs cycle, right? I started showing him all this stuff and just filling the board and giving him little explanations of why all this stuff's important. And by the time 20 minutes had went by, I'd probably written 35 things on the board and I was probably halfway done. Mm. And I said, are you, are you, do you understand how complex this is now? And he was like, fuck, I didn't even think about it that way. I said, well, that's the problem is you got biomechanics, you got physics, you got muscle fiber typing, you got ligament tendon insertions, you got endocrinology, you got energy systems. You have, now you have different anthropometrics. Now you have to, to see if somebody has, good hip sockets or poor shoulders. Now you have previous injuries. Now you have previous training experience. It makes everything complex. And once he did that, me and him became really good friends and he started to understand the complexity of the job and what it would take. And did I do everything right? No, nobody ever does anything right. I think the closest thing we can, we can strive towards as coaches and trainers is being able to try to be 90% right. Because the other 10% will take a lifetime to understand. And that's okay. I mean, you know, I was actually talking to Dr. Kramer about this, which is probably the most published person in exercise science that I know of. I, I'm, I'm sure he's been over in over a thousand publications. Um, he was my ex-teacher. And he said, you know, Matt, you know what the biggest problem with understanding how all this works is? And I was like, what's that? And he goes, you run out of time. He goes, I'm 70, 72 years old now. He goes, I've studied this my whole life. And I just feel like now I have a grasp on all of how all of this works. That's passion as well. I mean, you can hear the passion from that as well, that it's just yeah. that's carried him through to, to seek that knowledge. And then it's what's the name of the thing? The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Well, this is really interesting. So I had another professor named Dr. Newton. And he runs Edith Cowan University in Australia. He was my graduate professor. He was at that time the highest educated person studying strength and power for NASA. And uh, he was my professor. And he told me something I'll never forget. He said, Matt, he goes, graduating high school means you know how to show up. Graduating with your undergrad means you know how to jump through hoops. Getting a master's degree means you know a lot about one small area. And getting a PhD opens your eyes to realizing that there are 5,000 other areas that you'll never understand. Yeah. Yeah. It's so my so point niche. being is like, yeah, my point is, is like, you know, and it's training is the same way. It's almost worse because in training, because of all those areas, you know, my master's is in biomechanics, but I've had to learn and understand so much about energy systems and muscle fiber typing and recovery means and stress factors, you know, and all these other things that make you a successful coach that we never even touched in school. Mm. But because I went to school knows that I know where to look for information. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, a because, yeah. 
Yeah, but because I've also broke world records and pushed my own genetic limits, I know what's bullshit and what's not. Mm. So again, having both of those is a mixture. And that's why my my biggest idol in this entire scenario was Dr. Fred Hatfield. He was a thousand pound squatter and he also had his PhD. And he also was one of the first ones in the Western world to talk about compensatory acceleration, which means in a nutshell, get faster to get stronger. And so this is in the seventies in the early eighties, Louis Simmons wasn't even talking about any of this yet. So imagine a guy that squats a thousand and is also talking about getting faster to get stronger. You know, like those are the kind of guys that blow my mind because those were the guys I wanted to emulate because not only could they talk about training at a high level, they actually did it, mm. you know? And is, is that the premise of maximal power output? You're, you're increasing maximal power output rather than just loading up weight on the body and shifting the weight, even at a regardless of pace, but you're, you're getting the same sort of maximal motor pool unit recruitment because you're working at speed. Is that, is that the, what's the premise behind that? So in compensatory acceleration has a couple of different things. One, you're absolutely right. You fire more motor units if you try to move something at a higher velocity. And obviously, a heavy weight's not going to move at a high velocity, but it doesn't mean you don't attempt to try. The next thing that it does is that it um, blows through sticking points because you're creating inertia. So you're actually fighting against gravity. So if I can get a weight to return faster, I mean, if you look at Olympic weightlifting, those guys are insanely explosive, but I wouldn't say that they're insanely strong because mm -hmm. if you took, say, the new guy, Lasha, that's like a freakazoid, make him squat 650 with a five-second countdown and a five-second count up. I bet you he can't do it. No. Because he's explosive. Now, what if he trained slow strength for six months and then built back in his speed mm. with this newfound grind strength? I think he'd be the first person to clean a jerk over 625. But the point is, is and I'm not saying that's his weakness because I don't know. But every time I've ever watched him train, I've never seen him do anything hard, like as far as grinding hard. Mm. So the point is, is like he might be missing a humongous aspect of his training. Um, and that's just one example. But Fred Hatfield was the first guy I knew of to talk about getting faster to get stronger. And that was the first inclination in the West of the dynamic effort method. Mm. And, and how much do you bring in? Like, what, what would you for a new person starting? going into the gym and trying to sort of get their head around all of this different stuff. Like, would you say that they should look at trying to build in variation at the start, you know, building in things like maximal, uh, maximal loads or anything plyometric or anything first, or should they focus just like we're talking about on a niche? Like, should they focus on like just getting like their back squat up or getting their deadlift technique? That's a difficult situation because everybody starts with a different amount of puzzle pieces of the puzzle. Some guys start with the entire puzzle half put together. They're already good athletes, so they can jump to next stages quicker. But in reality, what the beginner should be focusing on is technical mastery. You have to develop a bulletproof motor pattern that will not fade under velocity or strain or fatigue. And then once you have that, that perfect motor pattern set in place based on your build and your ability, then you start to up the load. So if we know from reading the Soviet text that you can still make progress at a 40% load, then in reality for the first two years, you really probably don't need to train anything over 70% to get better, but you need to make that 70% absolutely perfect. And that's the biggest problem is they start pushing to the number that's on the bar versus looking at all the other factors like, is my technical mastery at, at a highest level? Once it is, and it can't be broken, then all you have to do is get stronger. That's the easy part. But I think the problem is we skip over and we think, ah, you know, pushing my knees out when I squat and keeping my elbows in when I bench, that's not that big of a deal. And then what you find is two years later, you're stuck in a rut at say a 200 kilogram bench and it won't move because now you got to go back and fix all your form. So that means you got to take 20, 30% more off the bar, fix the technique and then build it back. And most people don't have the ego to do that. Yeah. 
that's the mindset. It's a real difficult mindset shift. It's like we've seen those golfers who try and change their swing and they just get grooved in and grooved in and grooved in. They can't drive the ball over, you know, 200 yards and then they regress and the rest of their game goes to shit because they don't know how to use these tools anymore. They're only they're relying on one thing. So, I mean, it's, it's in the whole, um, the factory style gym is not set up for that as well. I mean, it's just set up yeah. for, for bench press and, and general gym. fitness. Yeah. General fitness, which I don't think there's anything wrong with, but it's far cry from improving to an elitist level. Well, it's a far cry from perfection. That's the other thing too, you know, is, you look at, for me, I always wanted to do everything that I ever put time into at the highest level I could, or to me, it was a waste of time. So I wanted to read, I wanted to get better. I wanted to be around guys that were higher level than me and that upped my game, but it also made me not fear people that were better than me. And I think that's another big issue that we have in society today. If somebody is, you know, 50 steps ahead of us, instead of us trying to catch up to them, we avoid them. Mm -hmm or we shun them or we say, well, this guy's on drugs or this guy's this. Did you ever think that maybe that guy just wants to, wants it worse than you and he wants to work harder than you and he wants to learn more than you. But see, the problem is to say that means that you have to internally look at yourself and realize that you're fucking up. It's not somebody else's problem, but that again, going back to society today, that's not how we're brought up and that's not how we're taught. 100%. I mean, it's it's easier to cast the stone at someone else than it is to look at what the issue is with you, because then you have to acknowledge all these things like you're not perfect. You're probably avoiding your problems. You probably you whatever it is, drink too much at the weekend. You probably like, you know, indulge yourself on the wrong things. And um, society's there to pat you on the back and say it's OK because it's all too hard anyway. So, you know, yep. don't worry about it. Don't worry about not excelling because it's perfect yeah. for, for these guys in power, for people not to excel because it makes it easier for the people who are really driven to kick them back down the ladder and go, fuck you. I'm I'm going to take what's mine. I've had to do that multiple times in my career because, you know, it's sad to say it, but average people that don't want to give up everything to be better will try to drag you down to their level mm -hmm. because they know it maybe it's not intentional, but sub subconsciously, a lot of people don't want others to succeed because then it brings out their shortcomings. And so you ever notice that the top level athletes are super isolated and super loners. Mm. I mean, you hardly ever saw, you know, other than if he was going to a little gambling thing with his friends, you never saw Michael Jordan in public much mm. unless he had to go. Right. You never saw when's the last time you saw Usain Bolt going and doing a bunch of stuff in public or Michael Phelps. I mean, those guys are in some ways when you become a champion, you become a loner mm. because even family per se will drag you down because they don't have the same goals. And they don't understand what you're trying to do. You know what I mean? hundred percent. And I think that comes down to only those mindsets get to the top because they're able to hyper-focus and cut away the distractions. You know, that like someone was saying the other day, a lot of people have many things in their life that they think are important. Yeah. And they're not willing to, they're not willing to sacrifice the important stuff because you know building relationship with family that's important building relationship with friends that's important but x y and z you've got to make your choice if you want to be great you've got to make your choice and if you make your choice to you know not go out and sleep with lots of women and not go and have drinks on the weekend with your friends that's fine that's a choice that you can make and hyper focus on your on your strength or your work or your sport or, or your or you know your business whatever it may be like the person that makes it to the top understands that there are sacrifices. The person who can't make it doesn't understand how to cut away the distractions and yep. decide what they really want. You're absolutely right. You know, for me, it was, I just love training so much. I didn't care how long it took to get good. You know, for me to go and get my degree, it's because I wanted to understand at first everything to get better for myself. Then I felt like if I could master myself, I could help other people master themselves. Yeah, I love it. And I love the message you're putting out there to everyone. And we're coming up to time. We've spoken more than we were, we were scheduled to, but I love it, mate. I could speak to you for another five or six hours, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to keep you in here. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do is we'll, we'll do another podcast here sometime soon. Mate, I'd love to. I'd love to. But, you know, just um, for anyone who's who's listening now, where can they find more information about you and what can they expect coming up in the, in the future? Yeah, so if you go to winningstrength.com, um, you're going to find the website, manuals, um, if you go to uh, winning strength on YouTube, 
There's over 300 plus uh, educational videos. Um, if you go to Instagram, I post a lot of the exercises. Uh, Patreon, we put all the workouts that I do with myself and my clients, both as weight loss, older populations, three times a week, people that are super busy and want to get the most out of the least, and then full all in 100 miles an hour, which is what I write for myself and my super dedicated clients. So they get all that on Patreon. And then we also have Train Heroic for, I would say, the lower experienced lifters because it has videos of each exercise and how to do them. So there's no mix up on those exercises and how we perform them. Um, we also have online coaching on the website with guys that's played in the NFL or been pro strength coaches or highest level college strength coaches to individually tailor all of these workouts. And I strongly recommend that beginner and intermediates be on there because it's easier to get stronger with a good motor pattern when you first start than it is to be doing something wrong for a multiple amount of years and then have to take 10 steps back to get better because you missed a, a crucial step in the development process. 100%. I love it. I love it. That's seriously valuable to anyone getting into lifting at the moment and who's anyone who's in lifting right now and struggling. So, mate, Matt, thank you so much for coming on. I've loved it. And uh, I'm looking forward to our next one. No problem, buddy.